Hello, everyone. It's time for another lesson, the full version of which can be found on our church website, trinityscarsdale.org slash a-full-catechism. Today's lesson is lesson six. It won't be very long. It's just the Apostles' Creed introduction and first article, of which there are three articles in the Apostles' Creed. So we'll begin. We start a whole new chapter, if you will, this lesson. The second chief part of the Catechism consists of the Apostles' Creed. This creed was set down historically in the early 4th century and is agreed upon and submitted to by every mainline Christian denomination. It is the oldest of written creeds and goes back to the 1st century via oral tradition. The creed from the Latin credo, meaning literally I believe, essentially lies out the most essential doctrine of Christianity and provides all that is necessary for salvation, concentrating on the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, in the second article. It's split up into three articles again for the three persons of the Trinity, if you will. For a church to either deny or say it isn't important to subscribe to the Apostles' Creed, is crippling, to say the least, and is evidence that they do not put any importance in the authority of the Word of God or its faithful preservation down the ages through the Church, which is very sad indeed. The separate churches then separate themselves and identify themselves as something other than confessional churches. As confessionals, we identify ourselves as those who confess the essential truths each and every week, in fact, as it's part of our service. Without them, all is in vain. Later, the creed was expanded to combat certain heresies that infiltrated the church, despite the clarity of the creed. Constantinople affirmed the new creed, now called the Nicene Creed. We also subscribe to this, but for our purposes, we need only to look to the Apostles' Creed, so we press on with its explanation, perhaps including some major Nicene points of clarity here and there. First, the Apostles' Creed in its entirety and then in its parts. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Small Catechism, page 102. There's a clear Trinitarian outline here, and some have also split the parts into other theological concepts as well, such as creation, redemption, and sanctification, seeing as these seem to be the primary concerns of each of the persons in unique relation to us, though of course none of the persons of God work apart from the other, which brings us to the mystery again of the Holy Trinity itself. The Holy Trinity is essentially both three and one. We neither say there are three gods nor one person. God clearly reveals himself as both one essence and yet somehow distinct in three ways. We do not know how, yet we trust in this truth, for it is how God has revealed himself. He is not two or four or any other number, but distinctly three. Three, therefore, is also a significant number throughout the scriptures and has been used to recognize divine significance slash intervention slash importance in some contexts. There's simply a mystery to God that we cannot understand in our limited dimension. The existence we know as this universe which God created which must, of course, be inferior to himself, who is limitless. A philosopher once put it very aptly, God is greater than that which can be conceived. So whatever we can think up, God is greater than that. And some of us have impressive imaginations as well. 
Yet he is not defined by what we imagine, but how he has personally revealed himself to be. Hence the Trinity. We define God no more or no less than he has revealed himself to us to be. Hence the Creed. We come to the first article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. It's that simple. It's one sentence. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason, and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Small Catechism, page 108. The first article takes almost no explanation, or shall we say is self-explanatory. God the Father is certainly the will of God. How many times do we hear Jesus refer to the Father, for instance? Jesus, of course, continues in this ancient tradition. He's not the first to use this, but it is how God has revealed himself from the beginning. And it makes perfect sense, too. He doesn't use a confusing image. Fathers beget children. And it makes perfect sense, too. He doesn't use, again, confusing language. The Son of God is one of the titles given the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. This speaks of a special, that is, unique relationship God has with himself, but it also speaks of his relationship with the rest of mankind, his creation as well. God didn't just create us. According to Genesis, we are also the cap of his creation. Created last, all that was created before us was created in preparation for us, and Adam was told to rule over it and to look after it. And as we will see in the next article, having saved us, God gives us as much worth as his only begotten son, referring, of course, to Jesus' uniqueness again, his divinity. Not to say that we are divine, but that as we certainly are his creatures and the cap of his creation, we are as precious to God. God even considers us his children, therefore, because of Jesus. This makes Jesus our brother as well as our saviour. It makes us co-heirs of eternal life, all because God the Father, in his infinite wisdom, said, let there be light, and on and on, until he breathed into us the breath slash spirit of life. No doubt about it, we owe our very existence to God the Father. But he does not create us equal to Jesus because Jesus is God. We are not created equal to God. And though Jesus becomes incarnate, as we'll explain in the next article, he is not created. These are important distinctions. And I should mention, I'm not sure why it wasn't in there, the fact that we are created in the image of God. Right? He doesn't create the animals in the image of God of God. This is another important distinction. We are created uniquely and in a different process to the way one would theorize evolution would occur. Creation is different when it comes to mankind. He creates us in his image and he creates us with his very breath. We'll continue with the next article next lesson. God be with you, and we'll see you soon.